welcome all those who have um, tuned in, including my fellow crewmates from 45 years ago, um, down in Adelaide in, and uh, up in Gympie and also in London. So um, I thought I might just start off by uh, giving you a little bit of background and just sort of setting the scene of, of how all this started. Back in 1870, the uh, clipper ship Patriarch uh, set some incredibly fast speeds for the uh, passage from England to Sydney and also back again. Uh, in fact, the, the record they set, 69 days, um, had never been broken and was the inspiration of the race that I'm about to tell you about, um, where uh, some race organisers decided that they would like to see if modern day yachts could in fact beat the record set by these, uh, these clipper ships of the, 19th, of the 18th century. And uh, th this is a picture of Patria um, under full sail and also carrying cargo, uh, unlike Anaconda. For us, the, um, the inspiration and the, uh, the man behind it all was uh, a chap by the name of Josko Grubik. He was a, uh, an immigrant from Yugoslavia, came out to Australia in the 1950s. Um, he was a successful businessman and built his business through making semi-trailers. Uh, he was a very driven sort of fellow, excuse the pun, and uh, he worked hard, but he was one of those can-do type people where nothing would stop him. He was, had fierce determination and uh, at the same time, he was introduced to sailing uh, by a group of people down at the South Australian Yacht Squadron fairly late in his life. But nevertheless, he discovered uh, a passion for sailing and very quickly he got involved building, uh, first of all, doing a Sydney Hobart in the French boat, and then later on with um, uh, building his own boats. And by the time it came to... Uh, uh, 1973, he'd had, uh, he built the Anaconda One and had a, um, assembled a, a, a reliable crew around him. And it was then that he had heard about the beginning of the Clipper race, the Financial Times Clipper race. And that inspired him to do something a bit more ambitious than just the Sydney Hobart. In fact, to build a boat that would compete in the, uh, the, the race itself. So in 1975, in the early part of 1975, uh, he commissioned a naval architect called Alan Buchanan in England to design a boat that could be competitive in the race. And uh, he had some plans sent out from England and started, uh, managed to secure some building space in a shed in Port Adelaide and got some instructions from the naval architect on how to build a foam, foam sandwich 83 foot boat. And simply, uh, the, the boat was made by a fairly unique method in those days by uh, stapling sheets of foam over timber battens and then fiberglassing over the top. It was all done by um, a, a couple of fellows who had used to make swimming pools. It was all um, driven very simply by people who, um, who read plans. There wasn't any, uh, at that stage, any professional boat builders involved. It was just reading from plans and instructions used to come from telex by telex machine uh, from England, uh, stage by stage. So if there was any complications or any difficulty, you'd just send a telex to England and you'd wait for the reply to come back on how to fix it. Uh, various shots of what boat was like whilst it was under construction. And uh, one of the very interesting things, it gives you an idea of the scale of things, fairing the hull once the boat was upright. One of the things that was amazing, I think, when we were building the boat, because I was involved uh, as part of the volunteer team, 
was the way the boat was built upside down and then the, the, the deck was also assembled while the boat was upside down and then turned the right way up. So it was quite a tricky business, uh, fiberglassing a boat upside down and the deck upside down and then uh, the two bolted together and turned right way up. Boat was so beamy in the shed that we actually had to cut a couple of the supports um, that held the shed up where the, the, the maximum beam was. I'm not sure if I could show you that with the point of it, but a couple of the beams supporting the roof got cut out there. Uh, lots of fiberglass, lots of fiberglass dust, um, but you could see the hull was taking shape. Meanwhile, the mast was being made in another factory down the road in Yosko's uh, trailer factory. And to get the boat, uh, the mast to the boat, it's no problem. A whole bunch of volunteers turned up one Sunday morning, put it on a couple of trolleys and wheeled it out the shed uh, down, down Grand Junction Road, uh, across the, the bridge and then to the, the shed where the boat was being built. Never um, a question of needing any police escorts or uh, permissions from anybody. It was just done in those days. Very simple. While the boat was being launched, and this is in about uh, August in 1975. Yosko had, um, was supervising the boat coming out of the shed. And the boat um, uh, pushed hard against one of the cradle arms and it hit him on the head and on the legs and gave him a fractured skull and uh, a couple of broken, or a broken leg very badly. So he was unable to, uh, to get around for a couple of months. And so the uh, the, the, a team of volunteers that were involved in the project continued to finish the boat uh, whilst he was in hospital. And then later on, when he was well enough, he used to come crawling down onto the boat. We put a plank out for me, get down onto the boat and uh, direct the completion of the, the boat uh, from, a, from, a, um, uh, from a position of sometimes he was on a wheelchair and otherwise he was just sitting in the cockpit um, directing things with his, with his leg in plaster. And uh, whilst all this was going on, of course, the first half of the race had taken place where the, the, the boats from England were making their way out to Australia. They'd started it on the, 30, the, the 30th of August and were uh, on their way nonstop to, to Sydney. So uh, the... Um, Two things were happening. It was originally intended that we try and get over to England uh, for that race, but with Yosko's accident, that just wasn't possible. Next project, once Yosko was able to uh, take command, was to go out for sea trials. These were held uh, out in the Gulf, um, just uh, out from Outer Harbour where the, the boat, uh, or Port Adelaide where the boat was kept. And uh, we, uh, put the word out to try and uh, find crew that might be interested from not only Adelaide, but also from other parts of Australia. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about crew selection uh, uh, when I really get to it. So early December, the boat leaves Adelaide and gets sailed around to, to uh, Sydney. And this is a shot of Anaconda alongside the wharf at, uh, or the dock at Ranser as it was then in 1975. That's the boat. And uh, I might just say at this stage, Anaconda had not done a lot of sailing. The longest passage was from Adelaide to Sydney. Um, the crew uh, had not um, been decided and uh, there was still an awful lot of preparation to be done ready for the starting line on the 21st of December. One of the obvious things that needed to be done was to vittle the boat. Uh, scene of chaos, uh, a, few, a few packages of, of food that were um, brought down to the boat. This was not only ourselves, but the boat alongside the boat called Critter. And I'll tell you about the, the boats in the race in a second. But uh, 
food storage was was critical. There was a lot of frozen food that we brought a, we had brought aboard. We, the boat was fitted out with some um, large freezers, uh, a lot of freezing capacity, and that was driven by the main engine um, through compressors. Uh, we had, among other things, about 15 kilos of margarine that was carefully stowed in the bilge. And uh, of course, a massive amount of dry stores. But the difficulty was, we didn't really know how long it was going to take to get to England. We'd never done a trip before of any of that sort of length. So it was really difficult to figure out how, how, what the quantities uh, that we would need to uh, keep us all going not only the quantities of, of uh, food, but also things like the amount of gas that we needed to carry for the, uh, the stoves and the um, amount of uh, water. Uh, we thought we had, were pretty ripe for water and we thought we were pretty ripe for fuel. So the boats that were in the race, Great Britain too. Uh, so the, the four boats I'm about to tell you about had already sailed out from England and had already um, had uh, proven themselves as uh, seaworthy, capable and handling storms and so forth. Um, and at this point, I might just mention Great Britain too was crewed by a pretty experienced bunch of, um, of uh, combined servicemen from the UK. Um, they trained, uh, they trained and done a thorough job. Uh, but also, funnily enough, one of the crew members was taken from the um, Australian Army, a chap by the name of Captain Brian Hayden, who happens to be a member of the Yacht Squadron. Crudo, uh, almost the same size as Great Britain too, from France. Uh, a boat called um, the Great Escape from Holland, and there's a a fourth boat called CS NRB, whose um, picture I don't have. So this shot from the deck of Anaconda, just after the start heading out to the heads on the 21st of December. Lots of boats uh, wishing us well. In those days, there's no um, uh, exclusion zones. Boats could come up alongside us and uh, wish us well and uh, uh, all that sort of thing. So there was a heap of atmosphere, a lovely, a lovely sunny um, day on the harbour and uh, a, a nice light southerly. So our first, uh, at this stage I might just tell you a little bit about the rules. Uh, well, they weren't too complicated, certainly the course wasn't. Uh, you start up from Sydney, uh, you leave Cape Horn to port and you finish in Dover. Uh, exactly where you sailed after that was your choice. They did have some conditions about not uh, about radioing in, but they weren't too arduous, but you were pretty much um, on your own there and able to um, choose where you went. I've tried to copy a little bit of where we, we sailed to give you a bit of an idea of the, the course. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened on our approach to New Zealand, uh, what happened around we, near the international dateline here, and then uh, what went on with this pointy bit going down here. So the crew, the crew was, um, and how we got to the crew, or how the final crew ended up was quite interesting. I mentioned Josko Grubik there in the blue, Tucked in behind him is first mate, Chuck Wall-Smith. Chuck uh, was a very experienced sailor, long-term um, uh, first mate with Yosko. Uh, he'd already done, I think it was something like a dozen or more Sydney Hobarts with Yosko. Uh, I managed to get it in the frame there. Um, Roger, Nick, and... Um, Hands here were from interstate. They had uh, come down to Sydney, uh, down to Adelaide to do various um, sailing trials with us and it had impressed uh, Yosko and Chuck. Uh, and we thought they were um, very worthy, worthy um, 
people that are agile, that are smart. Uh, and in Nick's case, he was um, gallant. He uh, jumped over the side in the middle of the Port River to rescue the Osco's cap that had blown off. So um, that immediately impressed the Osco. Paul Howard here, that scruffy fellow there with the beard. That's um, Paul from England. He came out specially to join us for the race. He came with a, uh, a great sailing reputation. And he also came with an emergency radio, a hand crank radio, which we needed for the rules. Very expensive. Uh, we couldn't afford one, but Paul bought one out. Um, never to be opened, he said, because he had to return it when he got back. Uh, Martin Carney was a um, long-term crew of Anaconda and well-known to Osco. Um, Owen Tawatha, a, quite an experienced sailor from the Yacht Squadron, the South Australian Yacht Squadron, a uh, uh, very steady hand. Now this character here, also looking a bit scruffy, is Lou, the navigator. And how he turned up was an interesting story. He he, he was in the hydrographic office in uh, Sydney in the chart department when Yosko approached the hydrographic department and said that he uh, was planning on sailing to England in the race and would like, uh, would it be possible to get, uh, or the, would the Australian Navy be prepared to make available some free charts? Uh, the Navy thought that wasn't such a big ask and made, made charts available. and. He also said, oh, by the way, also could do with a navigator. And Lou said, yeah, well, I don't mind. I can do that. So he put his hand up to, to join us as the navigator. As simple as that. Similarly, um, this character here, Dougie Justins, was the doctor. Josco, of course, as I mentioned, was pretty frail, um, coming not long out of hospital and in need of... Um, a close monitoring for medication and so forth. So he saw fit to uh, invite a doctor aboard. Fortunately, uh, Doug had made arrangements to do his anaesthetics uh, course in London later that year. And so this, this was a, a great opportunity to get over there and save an airfare. So he jumped at the opportunity. I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the watchers in a moment, but I just wanted to get the race underway. So there we are. Heading south, going across the Tasman, uh, in a bit of a breeze, um, but that's what the boat's all about, we thought. A um, few waves pushing the boat round, gets a bit rough. And second night out, we discover that there's um, all sorts of diesel floating around in the bilge. We thought, that's a bit strange. Um, we pump out the, the bilge, and we're pumping out an awful lot of diesel. And uh, we're sort of trying to deal with the storm and the diesel and um, the bilge water and trying to work out what's going on. And also, of course, keep the, the fridges going. So we run the main motor and we run the main motor, but it doesn't start. We've got a bit of a problem here. Um, leave it a couple of days so that things can settle down with uh, getting the boat uh, Sailing and in the race without, um, we, knew, we knew that we could wait, wait for the storm to abate and we'd be all right. And uh, it um, turns out that the motor wouldn't start at all. The big main motor that ran our generators and ran our uh, fridges had seized up. And it flattened, the battery couldn't get it started. So um, that wasn't uh, a good start. And the uh, additional backup generator, the little Dunlight generator was okay, but it wasn't meant to, uh, to power the boat and the refrigeration system and all that sort of thing. Um, anyway, we pushed on, uh, not far off from um, making a, a landfall, an unintended landfall to the south of New Zealand. We had a bit of a rigging problem. We woke up uh, in the morning, the storm had died down a little bit, but still a problem in the uh, inner force day had fallen off. So we had to send somebody up the mast to uh, put the inner force day back on. Then uh, later on, the sea comes down a little bit and uh, we got a call from, uh, a radio call from the Penrod 73 
oil rig saying that they've got some uh, charts for us. And uh, we thought, well, that's interesting. We thought we were pretty right for charts, but it turns out that they had some special charts that it, well, they, they through, through them, they were radioing uh, an arrangement to have the charts airdropped. They were shipped across from Sydney uh, to Invercargill and the Invercargill Aero Club was going to drop these, these, these charts off to us. They were in fact charts for the Omega navigation um, set that we had on board the boat. Wasn't vital, we didn't need them, but um, it was good to, good to have them and they were more than willing to, to drop them off. So at the arranged time, the plane, little light plane from Invercargo Aero, Aero Club comes flying over and with lo lots of um, the crew members ready to jump in the water and boat hooks and grapnels, we reach over and we pull out the package only to unwrap the, the, the package of charts to find that they um, were of the Mediterranean, no use at all. But uh, the funniest thing was the day after that, we were still in the Fervo Straits and we get a paper delivery from a fi passing fishing boat. We're on the front page of the paper, a big photo of Anaconda with all the crew reaching over trying to pick up the charts. And the caption says, vital, chart drop, saves Anaconda too. Christmas day, of course, uh, couldn't miss out on a good Christmas feed. So um, uh, we um, were able to uh, enjoy festivities down below whilst the boat was in, um, in racing mode up on deck. However, a um, Chucky, Chucky and uh, the, the doctor, Doug, started giving a bit of thought to the stores that we had on board and uh, how far we had to go. Just um, getting some estimates from the navigator, realised that um, we might be, we might be um, stretched a bit on the food department. So they pulled everything out of the locker. All the food came out of all the lockers and was a big inventory was made and we divided it by the number of days that the navigator thought we were going to take to get to Dover and did and basically did this this chart of rations, divided it all up. And it might look like a menu to most of you, but in fact, there's not a lot of food for each day. And uh, it was at sometimes quite slim pickings. Um, I might mention at this stage that we had planned to make one, uh, at least one serve of meat per man for each day of the race. And that was well and good uh, whilst the freezers were working, but we had problems, as I mentioned, with the freezers because the main motor wasn't working to, to run the freezers. So we had to... Um, start thinking about alternate plans. Heading further south, uh, uh, this was the sort of clothing we would be wearing. Uh, we we had not sailed in such cold waters before, so it was all a bit of an experiment with dealing with the cold. Not long before we got into icebergs and uh, Various different outfits were being tried to ward off the cold. Icebergs got a bit bigger and then a bit bigger. And I'll just um, pause for a sec here and I'll read you a little bit of a passage from my uh, diary. Now, I kept a little bit of a logbook and uh, I'll tell you what happened on the 7th of January when we were down in this area. So Thursday, the 7th of January, Latitude 61, longitude 134, 38 west. Had Vienna schnitzel for, for tea. Haven't had a wash or change for 15 days. Temperature about three degrees under the Dodger. Still getting 30 knot northerlies. Seas rough about 15, 20 feet. But worst of all is the thick fog, making iceberg siding difficult. Today would be about the most hair-raising experience, avoiding growlers, having to weave between them. 
on the 9 to 12 watch, Arthur steered about a quarter mile to windward of a sheer face block, leaving us agape watching the spray rise from the waves crashing over its extended platform through the fog. Friday, 8th of January. Latitude 62.32, longitude 127.48. Realised our true position this morning with a sun fix, which put us five degrees further south than expected. 66 degrees 30 south, making us one of the few boats ever to go to sail so far south. In winter, this area becomes an ice pack up to about 68 degrees latitude. <laughs> Excuse me. In fact, another 50 miles further south, and we probably would have hit the, the frozen mass in this fog. At, la at last, the wind has died down to 4.3 nor'easter, and we have tacked north to about 330 degrees compass, giving us a true course of about 10 degrees, which uh, is because we've got 40 degrees variation here. Um, this afternoon, we saw some of the most picturesque bergs. There you go, there's one. Those, those big uh, caves in the, um, the ice bot, bot, um, sides there were probably big enough to get most of Anaconda in there. So um, we actually didn't see Cape Horn and this was the sort of conditions that we had when we were around in Cape Horn. Uh, it wasn't hair raising, it was um, about 25 knots. Um, it had already warmed up a little bit from the icebergs. That so wasn't too bad, but that was um, day 30 from, um, from Sydney and we'd sailed for about 5,400 miles. So we turned north, freed the sheets a little bit. Um, wasn't bad sailing, we got some good miles up, but uh, we were sailing up uh, inside the Falkland Islands and fairly close to the South American coast. Uh, you can see roughly our passage there, you can see the Falkland Islands it wasn't really intended to go quite so close to uh, South America, <coughs> but um, uh, that was the way the wind took us. Uh, not far off Argentina, we had some uh, strong offshore winds that um, caused the boat to uh, heel right over in the middle of the night, uh, knock us down. We had the mast well below horizontal. Uh, middle of the night, we had, uh, I'd just come off watch, uh, the new watch um, fortunately had clipped on, but uh, the boat heeled right over crew down below, a couple of them, Chuck and the doctor had got thrown right across the, the full width of the boat, or the doctor did across 20 foot of the boat, hitting um, the post in the navigatorium on the way through. Both Chuck and the doctor were pretty much incapacitated, uh, but okay, they, they were alive. The, uh, all the stores in the galley were thrown out of the lockers. There was a tin of tomato puree, that just splattered on the, the uh, uh, saloon headlining and just splattered everywhere. Uh, I tried to get out of the, the crew cabin and the door was jammed with a whole mass of tins that had just jammed the door, couldn't open it. And when I did, it looked like somebody had been cut open with all the, the tomato puree everywhere. Finally got up on deck to check the crew and everything was okay. Uh, the, the crew had come to the end of their, their safety harnesses. Uh, the mainsail had been ripped from mast, from, from bluff to leech, uh, below the third reef, fortunately. But most, uh, most prominently was the fact that we were all just in shock. We just couldn't believe what had happened. And uh, it was the middle of the night, there was this, um, uh, pouring rain, there was this whistling wind, probably 40, 45 knots howling away. Uh, I could hardly talk to, to uh, make uh, 
arrangements but to to do the crew work to take the, the third reef in which we did um, and for the next couple of days we were we were um, very um, timid about putting sails up as you can imagine and of course we had to do a few repairs remarkably enough the the, the apart from losing the two uh, life rings over the side or the Dan boys over the side which we could retrieve and the the dodgers being stowed in and the um, and a bit of damage to the life raft and the mainsail being ripped in half, we were okay. Um, there's the mainsail down uh, being um, prepared for repair. And eventually we got sailing again and uh, uh, back into some um, more pleasant conditions. So um, a little bit more background about the, the sort of sailing and the, um, the weather and all this sort of thing. Uh, we had no no weather forecasting equipment apart from a barometer, so that was um, uh, fairly simple but uh, pretty pretty inaccurate. And we just had to, um, I guess, take one day after the next, and uh, hence things like knockdowns because we really didn't know better. Uh, navigating, as you can see, was all done by sextant, uh, and Lou was uh, very experienced at that. Most of the time he'd be taking stars of an evening uh, and um, a morning to be able to get some very accurate fixes. Uh, sending our position by radio back to race control was a bit of a um, hit, hit and miss affair. Uh, we were able to radio fairly easily going down past New Zealand, uh, beyond New Zealand to Cape Horn, we've virtually struggled to, to contact anybody. Uh, it was, it was very difficult. Uh, we had troubles with the radios, a bit of, a bit of water got into them. Uh, there was some chap at, um, bottom of, uh, uh South America there in, um, Ushuaia that kept on contacting us for days on his radio, keep on spoke, speaking about, um, about calling out Ushuaia. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, first mate, uh, the first thing he ever does is greet us all with an Ushuaia. Uh, it was funny, it is so different to what we do now. Um, race control weren't, weren't fussed that they didn't hear us, hear from us, from us for a couple of weeks. Um, they sort of expected that they'd hear us when the reception was good. Uh, and that was, that's what happened. <coughs> Daily routine was pretty pretty simple. I mentioned before we had, uh, well, maybe I didn't, there was 12 crew in total plus Yosko, the skipper, who stood out. So uh, of those 12 crew, we split into three watches of four. Uh, and then we worked three hours on, three hours off watch, then three hours on standby. So uh, three hours standby watch was the time that we were doing um, meal preparation. We would be doing maintenance on the boat and the, down below, sail repairs, gear repairs, uh, and um, cleaning up after the, the, the meals, which were six in the morning, 12 and at midday and six at night. And uh, things like making bread uh, were becoming, it were, were just a routine. We do that during our, our um, standby watch. And often it was um, a, a keenly sought after task because it got us away from the cold up on deck. All right, wrong way. Heading north, we had some pleasant sailing, uh, putting up spinnakers where we can. You can see in, uh, in our, our uh, 1975 days, we used um, laid rope for runners, that sort of thing where we could. There wasn't a lot of braided rope around. Uh, but where where we did benefit from braided rope was a, a sheet that was given to us by the crew from Great Britain too. And uh, it was one big heavy Genoa sheet, which we used to uh, tack from one, one side of the boat to the other, because it was one of the few ropes we had on board that could take the strain. That's a scene from down below from the forepeak. Uh, lots of stored heavy duty sails and all that sort of stuff. Uh, not many boats have a four peak quite uh, quite that big. Uh, it's looking aft, and you can see um, it might 
might look a little bit luxurious up there in the uh, uh, in the cabin, but um, it uh, it was uh, things deteriorated a bit. Lots of wildlife, uh, as you can imagine, was a bit monotonous looking out on the horizon for um, uh, day after day after day, and so uh, the sea life and the bird life were were wonderful, and we all became experts at spotting birds and. Uh, recognising the albatrosses and the sooty petrels and so forth. And uh, there was a tropic bird, there's um, Malbys, there's I'm not sure whether that's a killer whale or a shark or a dolphin, but anyway, there was plenty of those. Um, schools of dolphins, lots of things that um, kept us, um, uh, uh, kept our eyes out. And as I said before, things were... Um, getting a bit tough with all the food and the, um, as we headed north, the frozen food had defrosted and the meat was getting a bit, bit green, a bit slimy uh, as we approached the tropics. So um, each, each time we dived into the fridge, the freezer to, to get a bit of meat, we were um, uh, progressively eating meat that it uh, was getting uh, more slimy, but we were getting, we, we were sort of acclimatising at the same time, so uh, um, our ability to handle the, the green meat was adapting uh, pretty well, and uh, what we, we had then was probably not we, what we'd be able to handle right now. Paul there got a bit hungry, and he decided to try a bite on the, the flying fish. We had a few of those along the way. Um, some good sailing to be had, free sheeted, and off the boat we'd go, sometimes at 17, 18 knots. Most of the time, it was pretty hard to get it, get it going over, over 10 knots. As I said, we had all sorts of problems with um, the, the fuel tanks leaking and uh, the water tanks leaking into the bilge. And that was probably a, a result of the, the way the boat was built with the, the uh, fuel tanks and the water tanks being an integral part of the hull. And so any flexing in the hull caused cracks and then caused leaks. So we had... Uh, lost a lot of our drinking water, uh, so much so that there was concern that we wouldn't have enough. And uh, we had um, the uh, the idea or the necessity to sail underneath clouds, rain clouds, uh, in the hope that we might be able to catch a bit of rain and top up our tanks. So we got Chucky there to uh, hold his hands out and appeal to the rain gods. And lo and behold, he bought some rain and plenty of rain. And so what we did is uh, we celebrated when we got some. We were pretty, we were pretty desperate. Uh, Owen decided that he needed to wash his clothes. You can see on the left the um, jerry can, which was set up to collect water from these uh, a little boom troughs that were underneath the boom that collected the water that had run off the sail. So incredibly effective. And in the end, uh, our panic from water, for water wasn't really such a problem. Uh, okay, so um, the typical scene of drying out the boat uh, after things got a bit wet, you, um, you wouldn't um, probably see a modern day um, Volvo racer looking quite like this. But um, there were times when uh, some of us upset the, the skipper a little bit. Uh, and Yosko did have a, a, a little bit of a temper at times. And I remember plenty of times he'd uh, uh, lash out at me, if that's the right word, with things like, John Taylor, you stupid fool. I teach you everything I know and still you know nothing. But you get, we got used to it after a while and just um, carried on. There were quite a few odd sayings there that um, uh, Doug can relate to, I'm sure. Uh, night, uh, evening watches weren't always about um, keeping an eye out uh, on deck. Approaching the, the, uh, the, the tropics and the, um, and the equator, very light conditions, looking for breeze. And then uh, crossing the equator, well, you know, we had to do it properly. 
So those who hadn't crossed before had to um, go through the, the proper initiation ceremony. Uh, again, I don't think they do that so often in the Volvos. In the light weather, um, things, the conditions were very unpredictable. So we'd be putting spinnakers up uh, as often as we could. Uh, and occasionally we got uh, things came a bit unstuck. Uh, this is a classic where we got a terrible back, uh, wrap around the backstay. Um, not, not easily done, but we managed to do it a couple of times. And uh, there's two of us up there trying to untangle it. And then the inevitable repair. And this is where Arthur, um, the, uh, uh, one of our crew from Adelaide who, whose skills were um, in uh, motor trimming came into play. He was excellent. He, he, the poor fella, he must have repaired all the sails two or three times over. In some cases with the spinnakers, he had to rebuild the whole sail from virtually scraps that we'd pulled from underneath the boat. I don't know how he did it. Dougie, the doctor, was indispensable. He had this most fantastic sense of humour. Uh, nothing, nothing would get him down. He, he'd always see the bright side, uh, the life of Brian. He was just so good. Um, in this case, poor old Chucky got his fingers caught in the rail with a sheet. I think it flicked them up. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, he um, put a few stitches in there. No problem. <laughs> excitement whenever there was a plane or any activity flying overhead everybody come out on deck just to verify that there was some life out there on the other side of the boat uh, we had good conditions once again heading north once the uh, the the breeze came in north of the equator and um, I'll put this shot here just to, to remind me that most of the, the sail changes we could handle within a watch. So even though it was a big boat, um, most of the, the four crew members in a watch could do most of the, most of the time they could, could do sail changes. Uh, so with, with, with a certain method, you can see uh, plenty of sail there, all Dacron sails, of course, in, in those days. And uh, the um, size of the gear was pretty clunky. Uh, this is sort of a typical scene of getting breakfast ready. There's um, uh, a preparation for um, for for uh, breakfast. Rogers doing pouring at the porridge. Uh, there's the single light bulb just hanging above his shoulder. That was about all the light we had at this stage. The Dunlight generator that um, provided power. Uh, was just about on its last legs. It was um, mounted on gimbals with a flexible exhaust and uh, the exhaust regularly um, parted company, but regularly broke. Uh, and that caused the, the cabin to fill with fumes and uh, darken, the, darken the walls apart from giving us all asphyxiation. Um, and it was my job to decant the fuel for it. So I'd pump fuel out of the, uh, the fuel tank, which was contaminated with water. So the fuel, fuel diesel mix, I put it into a clear plastic uh, uh, container, a bottle, and I would decant off the good fuel into another container and then, of course, chuck away the, the remaining seawater and then very carefully tip that into the top of the Dunlight generator. And that would keep the generator going for another few days until uh, I had to do it all again. But it was um, uh, a bit precarious because we were also running low on fuel, given that most of it had been pumped over the side uh, from the leaking tanks. So um, at this stage of the story, we're uh, heading up towards um, the finishing line. I mean, there's still a few days to go yet, but you can, uh, we, we were, we we're making good progress. And in our minds, we knew that we were going to finish the race. It might be tough, but we knew we could do it. I had to throw this picture in because this was the, the scene in the, uh, the engine room. It was a, um, uh, uh, this was the, the flex, the flexible exhaust joint 
that um, uh, I was talking about that regularly broke. And uh, I might add at this stage that these photos, most of them were taken by Martin Carney, one of the, the um, original Anaconda One crew uh, who, who um, diligently kept a record of these, uh, of, of what was going on while we were all running around um, uh, doing, doing the crew work, or he was too, but he also had time to uh, get his camera out in some difficult circumstances at times and uh, put it all together. Uh, this shot shows just how much chafe there was on the mast from the, uh, the sails, the headsails, that it's caused all the paint to be chafed off. Uh, what um, at this stage the we we'd done uh, a lot of sailing and the boat was um, starting to show its age or show show its fragility. We had um, in this last week before the finish, the steering had failed, the goose neck had broken, uh, the backstay had stranded. Um, and as I mentioned, we had um, problems with the, uh, the, the, the power system, just enough to, uh, to keep the, the lights going well at the, to, to that stage. So the boat must have known that it was close to the finish. Uh, one, one sort of last effort breeze to, um, to get us up to the English Channel. A uh, little bit of preparation. Uh, some of the crew wanted to be, look their best ahead of the finish and um, Arthur and uh, uh, Arthur was just the man, the the, the uh, sail maker to to, uh, to to do the haircuts. Sailing up the English Channel, a uh, couple of days before the finish, maybe a day before the finish, this shot was taken. At night time, no lights, no not enough battery power to, to run lights, so we were zigzagging, uh, going upwind, in and out of uh, shipping the uh, the channel shipping coming the other way, scaring the daylights out of both ourselves and the, the ships coming the other way. Uh, but we were close to finishing, so we were pretty happy. Uh, the um, our welcoming party chartered a plane and flew down low overhead. Uh, as we could, um, as we were approaching, you can see the British coastline in the, uh, the background there. So. Uh, we were getting pretty excited. The white cliffs of Dover and Dover. So we had finished uh, at 2300 GMT time on March the 8th, making a total passage time of 78 days and 22 hours. Uh, we were second to Great Britain too by 12 days. So um, we'd well and truly um, been beaten by the, the Brits um, who themselves had, had broken the Patriot record uh, by a narrow margin. So they um, were in Dover to greet us and it was a serious celebration. As you can imagine, this was, this was taken not long after we tied up uh, in the middle of the night. And then uh, after celebrations, we um, uh, did a, a few repairs to the boat, enough to get the engine going, and we went up the Thames uh, to, um, to berth the boat at St. St. Catherine's Dock. And uh, there, there, we, um, there we are, uh, coming into St. Catherine's Dock, feeling... Um, feeling pretty relieved that we'd arrived at last and um, finally made it. So that pretty much ends the, the, the presentation and uh, hopefully there might be a few questions uh, from, uh, from the, uh, at least from maybe from the crew. They might be, although they probably know what happened and they're just going to pick me up on things. If, it, if anybody has any questions, raise your hand and I'll unmute you and ask JT directly. No. While we're waiting for that 
I'll ask a question. So, JT, did you ever feel at any stage you weren't going to make it? Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> plenty. First, the first time, Karen, was when, when we were getting to... To what we were sailing towards New Zealand, and the we we, we had a bilge full of fuel. We, we had the we had the inner force day fall off on us. Um, we we were wet and cold, and uh, uh, we, we we wasn't long after we realised that we were very we were going to be low on on food. And then uh, the, the, after we rounded Cape Horn, there was a second round of. Um, of that sort of desire. Well, we're not far from land here now. Maybe we, um, maybe maybe we could just pull into Rio, and um, uh, you know, pick up, get some extra supplies, and you know, have a bit of a rethink whether we want to keep going or not. And of course, if we ever did that, well, that would be the end of us. Okay, we got a question from John Biffin. I'll, uh... John, if you unmute your microphone, you can talk. There we go. Hello, John. Good day, JT. Um... I went on board the boat before it left Sydney. I'm just wondering how the uh, Regency wallpaper and the uh, mini chandeliers in Yosko's cabin stood up to the... Yeah, uh, yeah. you're talking about the Cape Horn Hilton, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just I know, wondered what I, I, I know exactly. Boat. I know exactly what you're talking about, uh, not to mention the shag pile carpet. <laughs> <laughs> there were there were times when um, it did get a bit thrashed. <laughs> I'm sure it did, <laughs> having seen what else went on. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you're wonderful. Gonna... Thank, thanks very yeah. much. I'll, yeah. I'll let someone else have oh, it. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it, John. We have a question from Gwyn Boyd. Ah, oh, Gwyn, how are you going? If you unmute for your... Well done, Eddie. Did you have an engineer on board? Well, uh, no, to Josco's credit, Gwen, he, he wasn't in watch and he spent a lot of his time keeping the systems going. I know, I know I described all the problems that we had and the breakdowns, but he did an amazing job trying to keep things going. Um, and, and that all stems from the fact that it was a bit of a mad rush getting the boat ready for the race. And so we didn't really have a chance to to prepare properly and, and fully test it. So the, the first proper test was really the early part of the race. Oh, but, but Yosko was constantly in the engine room with a big hammer trying to get things working again. A question from David Henry. David, if you unmute yourself on the bottom left-hand corner. That's right now, isn't it? Yep, I can hear you, David. Yeah, well done, JT. Uh, fantastic trip and, and really good reporting of it there. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I'm just wondering, um, did you bring the boat back from England or what was the... No. Um, after all that? Yeah, Yosko no, kept the boat in, in England for a couple couple more months and then uh, I think Owen, Owen Trawasa went back with him. Um, and I think he was the only crew that, that went back. He had a, a fresh crew and um, uh, sailed, sailed back uh, through the Pacific. And so uh, didn't, um, uh, I think that was a little bit more leisurely. All right, great. Question from Robert Dixon. Uh, Robert, if you want to meet yourself on the uh, bottom left-hand side. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, and uh, thanks, JT. Great, um, great story. Really well, really appreciate yeah. your time in doing that. Uh, my question is, uh, what did you get out of it the most? What did you take away from doing the trip that you didn't think you would? Well, and yeah, you appreciate yeah. the most. It, it's an interesting thing, Robert, and it, it, it's more so on the, the 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 people the people thing than it is the sailing thing. So, with all that sailing, I think it was um, uh, fourteen thousand seven hundred and fifty miles is is what we we recorded. It was it's those life skills of getting on with, with 12 other lunatics on the boat. Uh, you know, you, you, we were all packed in there and we had no say in where, you know, we couldn't just walk away uh, and, and say, well, we'll not see you again. We all had to get on. Uh, in some ways it was interesting. It was sort of a, some, some, some life, life experiences where um, there were times when there's lots of tension with the skipper. And I think even though the crew came from a diverse background, uh, we, we were, um, it's a bit harsh to say we all sort of banded together against him, but there were times when uh, 
I guess, you know, Yosko was, um, he was a pretty determined sort of guy. And, and if he wanted salt on his meat, then he got salt on his meat. Um, and this, this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, certainly, certainly um, uh, a, a, a tolerance for, for um, different personalities would be part of it, Rob. I've done some long ocean passages and it seems to be there's always one person who gets singled out to be the, uh, the, the person that everybody hates. Yeah, uh, you know, I think it's too easy to, to sort of give Yosko a hard time, but, it, you know, it's that sort of personality that you need to have the guts to put, put a project like this together. Uh, it, it's pretty remarkable that he built a boat uh, pretty much from, from scratch. Uh, with very limited budget uh, and inspired so many people to help him just build the boat. And then, of course, he had the accident, which really put him way behind things, probably shouldn't have gone at all. Uh, but being the t determined guy he was, uh, he wasn't going to stop at anything. And um, he, uh, uh, you know, he, he, you'd have to say that he was, he was a bit mad in doing it. But at the same time, um, the world needs a few mad people to do these things. Yeah, and we have a question from Lou Davidson. Ah, I've heard of him before. <laughs> Go ahead. Happy everybody from Gympie. Um, not so COVID restricted as some of you Southerners, but uh, I just wanted to comment on a statement uh, or a question that JT answered before. What did you get out of the... Out of oh, the well, okay. And... I of course, it got my daughter. <laughs> good on you, James. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, good, 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 good one there, Grandpa. That's a fair comment. I've got a something here too that you might remember. <laughs> I can't see it at the moment. Uh, anyway, can you can you can you recognise that this thing? Silver plate. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Good boy. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just, uh, because you and I are the only ones that probably know what it says, is that in recognition of 14,750 miles of gallant sailing by the Ketch Anaconda 2 in the Financial Times Clipper Race. By the Australian. Sid Sid Sydney to London, December 21, 1975 to March 8, 1976. Hmm. Presented by the Australian, Australia's only national daily newspaper. There you go. There you go. And we got a question from Peter Henry too. Oh, uh, hi, James. JT, uh, great presentation. Thanks. But who designed the Anaconda? Oh, a chap by England called Alan Buchanan, uh, a British about, yeah. naval architect. And he, you know, he did a terrific job. As I said, the whole thing was done by. Uh, well, first of all, he did the he, he drew the plans up and posted them out to to Adelaide, and then we started building the boat. We started lofting it in a in a wool shed down in Port Adelaide, and then uh, when there was any questions, Yosko had a telex machine in his office, and he'd just telex uh, a Buchanan of an evening, and we get the we get the. Uh, Answer back the next day. You know how 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 to build a boat by telex. <laughs> Thanks for that. Amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, that appears to be it, I guess. Oh, sorry, Richard Lawson's got a question. Is he Richard? If you want to mute yourself. On the bottom left-hand side of your screen. I didn't have I didn't have that before. Okay, thank you. Um, I've sailed on a boat uh, where we had no battery power. Um, on a boat I didn't really know very well, and also main, the main motor stopped working for us on a charter. Um, it's a very difficult situation. Um, how did you manage to have enough? I mean, I know you had a little generator, but. Was that enough to just keep the battery power that you did need to keep those well, systems working? Richard, everything was operated at a minimum. So we had we, we had we had no refrigeration. Um, we had, we basically had very few very few um, house lights, 
uh, we had enough power to keep the instruments going. Uh, the instruments in those days were not power hungry like they are now. Um, and uh, that was pretty much all we needed. But um, yeah, that was, there was, there was, there was um, uh, yeah, just sort of the, the essentials. We did have a, a chest freezer that, that uh, we could run from the, the, the Dunlight generator for a while, but when it got hot, it was overloading things. The other thing that I forgot to mention, uh, which was interesting, a little bit of a sidetrack, the boat was built with a, 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 a 24 inch fixed bladed propeller fitted, uh, which was the original sort of like you'd call it the delivery prop. Uh, when it came time to uh, put the racing prop on, um, we couldn't get the, the, the delivery prop off. So we had this massive 24 inch prop that we carted around the world. Oh, yeah, it's a bit slow. Oh, terrible. Yeah, apart from so the fact. What, what turned out to be the problem with the motor? Oh, well, uh, yeah, probably I didn't explain it properly, but because the uh, bilge water mixed with the fuel, the fuel and the bilge water got back into the fuel tanks. And so you got this mix of fuel and bilge water in the fuel tanks. So when we ran the motor, the main motor, the first thing that you that gets sucked in is the lower section of the of the, the fuel in the tanks, which of course is all all bilge water being heavier. And so that just went straight into the engine uh, and, and uh, through the injectors and it conked out. The, the filters and stuff just couldn't handle it. So when you got to Dover, you sort of sort that out, were you? Well, yeah, we had a we had a, an engine specialist uh, set work on the boat for a couple of days trying to sort it out. He pulled the engine apart, pulled the head off, and everything. Yeah. So we got one comment from Amanda Hicks saying, uh, "Fantastic presentation, JT. Many thanks." Pleasure, Amanda. And Genevieve Slattery also, JT, thanks, thanks very much. Hello here yeah. to experience this wonderful adventure on here. Did this <laughs> sutured finger receive a local anaesthetic? Congratulations. Yes, Dougie had everything. Uh, I don't know if it's possible, James, but uh, after we finish here, is it possible that we could just keep the, um, the Anaconda crew uh, on the Zoom? And so we could all have a chat. I guess so. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't even thought about uh, how we do that. I suppose if it, it just means everybody else can log off when when they want to, and we can just catch up. Okay, I'll stop the recording anyway. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. We, we probably don't want this uh, 